In a previous video, in this Age of Empires game hacking series, we used Cheat Engine to perform memory scanning to find the location of our player's resources within the game's active memory. Go and take a look at that video now if you haven't already, because in this video we are going to build on that information and take the next step in our game hacking journey. Memory scanning for our own users' resources is useful in single player games because we can use the structure location to perform resource hacking. Once we know the location in memory, we can increase our resources within the game world by modifying the data stored in that memory location. But can we use a similar technique to identify the location of other players' resources too? If that was possible, that way we could not only modify our own resources, but also spy on our enemy's resources too. If any enemy suddenly spent a lot of gold and food, we could infer, for example, that they have just upgraded to the next age within the game, or they have just performed a number of upgrades to their military units. Before jumping straight in, let's first think about what we are trying to do here. In general, in order for a game to draw the world, the game needs to know the location and status of different assets. For example, in a first-person shooter, the game needs to know where enemies are and how much health they have, in order to draw them and react when a player interacts with them. The game process likely has some central type or class to define what something is within the game world. So for example, with Age of Empires, there is likely some class which defines what a player actually is within the game world. The player structure needs to have a bunch of information stored about that player. The resource values, the player's current age, total number of units, basically everything that is needed to actually be a player within the game world. It's logical to assume that these similar structures are likely defined somewhere in a list or array for each player within the world. For example, if there are two players in the game, there would be two player structures and two players in the entity list. If there are three, then there would be three and so on. This so-called entity list is the data which we want to find within the game world. But how can we find it? Like most things we do on this channel, there is likely a number of ways to do this. But let's start with what we already know from previous videos. Firstly, we already know the location of our own player's resources within the game world. So let's start the game, attach the game process to a debugger, jump to the known resources location, which we have found before, and set a write breakpoint on this memory location for our current wood value. This write breakpoint will be hit and execution will be paused whenever this memory location is written to. With the breakpoint set, Let's jump back over into the game, collect some wood, and drop the wood off at our town centre. Dropping the resources off triggers the breakpoint, and we can take a look at the EIP register to see exactly what instruction has triggered the right breakpoint. Scrolling up, let's set a new breakpoint here at the very beginning of this function, and walk through the function flow the next time we drop off some wood at the town centre. Due to what we are looking for, this function is very interesting because we can see that there is no stack frame set up here when entering this function. Also, the ECX register is being used without being initialized. So that probably means we have found ourselves directly in a this call. This calling convention is used for calling C++ non-static member functions. On the Microsoft Visual C++ compiler, the this pointer is passing ECX, and it is the callee that cleans the stack. The definition of a this call is fairly familiar considering what we just saw in the function we are debugging, and that definition also means that the value in the ECX register is likely going to be interesting for us too. Walking through this function, we can see that the value at ECX plus 50 is moved into ECX for later processing. If we take a look at the memory ECX plus 50 is pointing to and view those values as floats, 
we can see that we have found our player resources location once again. Not surprising considering how we got here, but the interesting change now is how we have gotten here. If we look at this memory location some more, we can see that we have not only found resource values here, we have found a number of other statistics for the current user too. We have found the food, wood, gold and stone values, which we already knew about. But we have also found additional information, such as the player's current age and population. With further reverse engineering and playing of the game, it's possible to further identify what each of these different values represents within the game world too. But for our purposes, this is all we really need to know for now. If we continue program execution with the breakpoint still in place, we can use this same step-by-step -step process to also find the resource locations for all other players within the game world too. Each time any player drops off wood, we will find the location of that player's resource structure within the game world as well. But how can we tell which player's resources we have found? Well, we know the location of the resource location, right? Which is ECX plus 50. So let's take a look at the base ECX value and see what other offsets can be found from that base address location. If we take a look at the values here, we can see what appears to be some direct values, but we can also see a number of other pointer values here, such as the pointer to the player's resources we followed before at offset 50. There aren't that many pointers, so let's just blindly follow each of these and roll the dice to see what we can find here from the base address. By brute forcing these few pointers, we can eventually find the name of the player is directly referenced from this base address too. So what have we actually found here? We have found what appears to be the player's base address location, which is accessible to the wood drop-off function via the ECX register within a this call. So with that information, let's use the code cave technique we learned from the previous video to hook this drop off wood function and store these interesting player base locations. There is likely a pointer somewhere which directly points to this entity list. But let's just continue to solve this with the code cave approach anyway. Let's switch over to Visual Studio and start adding some new functionality to our work in progress game trainer. We can define the total number of players, which for the Age of Empires game, is eight actual players, as well as the hidden Gaia player, which is a bonus player who is able to control wildlife within the game. We can then add the patch resource address, which we found in the wood drop off function we stepped through before, as well as the offsets we found from this base address to the player's name and resources. Let's next redefine the resource structure we've used before and add a few more values, which we have now found in addition to just the food, wood, gold, and stone attributes. We can then start defining functions and structures to actually store the player information in a useful way. Let's define a player structure, which for our use case is just a name character pointer, as well as an address for the player's resource address. We then need to have some list of these player structures defined for the total number of possible players within the game world. This is basically our version of the entity list. Next, we need a function to determine whether the player has already been seen and stored in our copy of that entity list. We also need a way to find a specific player based on their name. We can iterate over all player values and identify whether the specific player we are searching for can be found within the array. We also need a way to actually add a new player to the array. We also only want to add a player if we don't already know about them. To add a new player, we just store their name as well as the location of their resources. With the player's simple structures defined, we next need to create the actual code cave. Just like in the previous video, 
we want to pop the return address, move into the base address variable, the value in ECX, which we know from the reverse engineering step is the base address for the player structure. Then we call our add player function to store the player's name and resource address if we don't already know about them. Once we have stored the values we care about, we can restore the registers and the stack. And then we also need to recreate the instructions which we mangled with our hook right. Looking at the address, we are going to patch in a debugger view and knowing the jump patch is going to be five bytes in length, we can see that this is going to be a clean hook. We won't mangle any bytes with this write, so we don't need to add any no operation bytes either. But we will overwrite an instruction with our patch. So we just need to recreate this instruction in assembly with the move into AX ESP plus four here. Lastly, we push the return address back onto the stack and return execution there. We can add this new code cave to our existing initialize detours function and the completed hook is in place, set up and ready to go. Now, when our trainer is next injected into the game, our code cave function will process and store every player's name and associated resource data. This is kind of interesting, but not really that useful just yet. In the next video in this series, we are going to do some more reverse engineering to figure out how the game actually draws information to the game world. Then we're going to hook and influence those draw functions to create an easy way to spy on all other players' resources and statistics directly within the main game world's view. If you made it this far, thanks for watching. It really helps the channel grow if you comment, like, and subscribe below. Also, if you are interested in solving capture the flag challenges across a range of traditional Jeopardy based categories, including reverse engineering, make sure to check out 247ctf.com.